and these are in listen only mode. Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar presented by Dr. James Schwader. After tonight's presentation, participants should be able to assess the value of saline enhanced sonohistorography and learn the indications, contraindications, and technical aspects of performing various procedures. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this educational activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of a CME activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Schwader has no disclosures. During tonight's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may submit them by typing them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now, we're pleased to present Dr. James Schwader. Kathy, thank you very much. Welcome everybody to our seminar on sonohistorography and sonosopingography. As mentioned, I have no disclosures. And my hope over the next, say, 45 minutes is that we're going to discuss three really relevant areas in ultrasound. That of sonohistorography, placing fluid inside the uterus to assess the endometrium in a more complete fashion. Sonobiopsy, the ability to actually do histologic evaluation at the time of sonohistorography. And then sonosopingography, often called hycosci, which is really the ability with ultrasound to assess tubal patency. So let's start with sonohistorography. What I'd like to cover are our indications, our timing of the procedure, and then how to perform the procedure. And our basic indications are going to be abnormal uterine bleeding as well as assessment of uterine anomalies. I'm going to concentrate on abnormal uterine bleeding. When we look at bleeding, I think we have to break this down into the reproductive age group and the postmenopausal age group. And we know the college has given us guidance on evaluating patients in the reproductive age group. And we're supposed to change our terminology now to the new, new designation of abnormal uterine bleeding that's either heavy or intermenstrual. However, we all know with ICD-10 that menorrhagia, metrorrhagia, menometrorrhagia are the accepted terms, so we have not quite graduated to the new terminology. But in this, in the palm coin method, it really gives us an acronym that helps us understand the various causes of abnormal bleeding. And the one that's really going to be helpful for us with ultrasound is the structural causes, and the acronym is palm: polyps, adenomyosis, leiomyoma, and malignancy. And what I'd like to look at is how does ultrasound help us? When we're trying to make a diagnosis of a focal anatomic abnormality, such as a polyp, submucous myoma, or a focal malignancy, we have several options. The gold standard is still held out to be hysteroscopy. But ultrasound first was found to be very valuable, and with sonal hysterography, particularly now adding 3D, I think we will be convinced, hopefully, that this is very comparable to hysteroscopy in evaluating patients. Now, when I think about unusual findings in the endometrial cavity, I think of filling defects, submucous myomas, and endometrial polyps. This study, now 20 years old by Paul Inman, 
looked at doing ultrasound prior to office hysteroscopy, and he found that slightly more than half of patients had a structural abnormality when they presented with abnormal uterine bleeding. When I was in Denver, a colleague of mine, Buzz Brown, and myself, we had an SIS clinic. This was held on Wednesday, and patients came in. And what we did was replicate this study and found that about a third of our patients had a structural defect on SIS. Now, we then took these patients to surgery and confirmed the findings, which at surgery found that we had perhaps overcalled the number of polyps, with only about 30% of patients having a structural defect. Now, the question is, why did this occur? And this is a really key take-home point. When you do this procedure is very important. One thing I'll say is that if you look at the bottom corner here of my slide, you'll see these four areas that I put on every slide, every study I do. It's on my first uh, image. G's and P's, the patient's LMP, if they're on birth control, particularly if a hormonal suppressive birth control, and if they've had prior surgery. The LMP is critical because particularly in the reproductive age group, in a woman who is not on contraception, what we find is when you do the procedure will dictate what you find at the time of your ultrasound and saline infusion. For instance, if we do it right after they've menstruated, theoretically in the early follicular phase, it should be less than five millimeters in thickness. If we wait until mid-cycle around ovulation, the endometrium is typically around 10 millimeters. And if we scan a patient in the luteal phase, her endometrium could be as much as 18 millimeters thick. And when one does sonohysterography during this time, what you see is, is that the endometrium becomes polypoid. So it will replicate a polyp, perhaps, that when you go to surgery, you'll find out does not exist. So timing is critical. What I recommend is for sonohysterography, and I'm going to abbreviate this SIS now, saline infusion sonohysterography, is that you would like to schedule this on days 5 through 10 of their menstrual cycle. This avoids those abnormalities that are mimicked in the secretory phase. Conversely, a patient who's postmenopausal or a patient who's on long-acting reversible contraception, they can be scheduled at any time during the month. Now, what are the indications for SIS? Well, in the reproductive age group, several things. If you scan a patient with ultrasound and you don't see a distinct endometrial myometrial interface, that's an indistinct endometrium, and one can really make no comment about the presence or absence of a structural defect. Now, I would encourage you to become very uh, compulsive about measuring the endometrium. I see many people who they identify any white linear area in the endometrium or in the uterus, and they will measure that as the endometrium. I would say that in my hands, probably 10 to 20% of the time, I will indicate that I think it's an indistinct endometrium. I just can't see a good interface. A thickened endometrium at the wrong time in the cycle. If you suspect a polyp, and we'll give you some hints as to when to suspect that. If one does an endometrial biopsy that's inconclusive, if you want to take a patient to surgery and you want to do better preoperative planning, it's an excellent area to, to uh, use SIS. And infertility patients, we will use that, and we're going to discuss that later in this presentation. Now, we've mentioned five millimeters, and I want to make a point about one thing. Dan Breikoff did this study back in 2004. And at that time, we had determined that five millimeters was our break point on an abnormality. He curiously asked, well, how often are we going to find a polyp or fibroid in a patient with a thin endometrium? And what he found was 8% of the time, when the endometrium was less than 5 millimeters, he still found an endometrial polyp or some mucous myoma. One of the polyps was 1.8 centimeters. So I believe what we should take home with this, the take-home message is that if you evaluate a patient, elect not to do further evaluation, and they continue to bleed, consider adding SIS to look for a structural defect. Now, in the postmenopausal patient, the college gave us guidance. They said when a patient presents with postmenopausal bleeding, you have two options. You can do a biopsy or you can do an ultrasound. If you use ultrasound and the endometrial thickness is greater than 4 millimeters, that should trigger further evaluation. Do an endometrial biopsy, do sonohysterography, hysterography, or do hysteroscopy. Whereas if you did an endometrial biopsy and it returns tissue insufficient for diagnosis, that's inadequate. You need to do additional evaluation. So when we look at this, we say postmenopausal bleeding Thickened endometrium, tissue insufficient for diagnosis.
One thing I'd like to address is what about the asymptomatic patient in menopause who has a thick endometrium typically diagnosed as an incidental finding during another diagnostic procedure? Well, let's talk and show some pictures. Here's a patient who's postmenopausal, she is bleeding, and she has an endometrium that I would call indistinct. As we look at this, there is a heterogeneous endometrium. It's possible that we should measure here, but should we measure to here? Should we measure to here? It's difficult to say. In this circumstance, this does not look normal, so let's put some fluid in. And what we see is two significant things. One is we see a focal lesion in the anterior wall right here, but we see asymmetry. The anterior wall is not equivalent to the posterior wall. A blind biopsy does not assure you that you've adequately sampled this area. This patient actually has an area of focal endometrial hyperplasia, which if you biopsy this area may not show up. If you biopsy this area, you will. These are patients when it's a focal lesion, I will tend to take those patients towards hysteroscopy for definitive visualization and biopsy of that specific area. Here's an interesting case. A 58-year-old with postmenopausal bleeding had three pipel biopsies, and they all showed tissue insufficient for diagnosis. She was referred for hysterectomy, and I felt compelled to do an SIS on the patient. We put fluid in, and what it demonstrated was a 1.8 by 2.4 centimeter mass inside the uterus, which clearly is not normal. Now, if we look at the surrounding endometrium, it is paper thin. If one tries to biopsy this area, it will come back tissue insufficient for diagnosis, yet she has a large lesion present. Well, she went to hysteroscopy, and what we see is this fungating lesion. This is endometrial cancer missed with a blind pipel biopsy. So ultrasound is incredibly helpful in moving towards evaluation. Now, I'm oftentimes asked to do evaluations in patients who have been found to have a thickened endometrium, and they're otherwise completely asymptomatic. And there is great controversy among experts as to what to do in this situation. Some advocate, don't worry about it, they're asymptomatic. I try to look at the literature, and this is one relatively nice study in 2009 by Schmidt, they looked at 300 plus women who had an endometrium that was thicker than 6 millimeters, on average 12. And they did hysteroscopy and DNC in these patients. And what they found was about 75% of those patients had an endometrial polyp, and almost 4% had endometrial adenocarcinoma. So what I will tell a patient is, when you present with a thickened endometrium and you're asymptomatic, these are the possibilities we have. Now, should we pursue further evaluation? And I tend to do that. I have to admit, I will tend to evaluate the patient. Because if I do an evaluation and I see this, she's got an endometrial polyp, her endometrium is quite thin. It's 1.3 by 1.3, 2.6 millimeters total. The polyp is about one point, or about one centimeter in size. And so we have identified this. Now, there are some information which we're not going to cover tonight, but in patients who are significantly older, above 60, if they have large polyps, those are people who may have a little greater risk of malignancy that you may want to look at removing those for definitive diagnosis. So the asymptomatic patient, I think, is becoming more of a challenge for us, and I think knowing the data behind it helps guide our patients as to our further workup and evaluation. Now let's talk about some of the technical aspects of doing sonohysterography. First, I do an ultrasound, and I do a complete ultrasound because that allows me to evaluate the adnexa, the bladder, tubes for hydrosalpinges. It allows me to map out the endometrial cavity and gives me that unenhanced assessment of the cavity. Then one thing I do is I actually measure the cavity length. That's from the fundal endometrium to the external os. The reason for that is, is that if I use a catheter that has an acorn or a little pyramidal cone, and that's typically the Goldstein catheter, which I will show you a picture of, this will allow me to adjust that so that I avoid touching the fundal endometrium, the top of the fundus, with the catheter. If I look at discomfort at the time of SIS, it is really during three phases. One is passing the catheter through the internal os. Two is if the catheter touches the fundus. And three is I inject fluid too rapidly, particularly if I've used a balloon catheter, they will have more discomfort. So let's look at a study. This patient has a retroverted, retroflexed uterus. 
it has an endometrial thickness of about nine millimeters. I suspect that she's probably day 12 or 13 of her cycle. If I measure the cervix and then I measure the fundal length, it's 7.9 centimeters. I will set my little cone around seven to seven and a half centimeters. <clears throat> now, once I've done the ultrasound, then I do my pelvic exam. I visualize the cervix. This is when I determine which catheter I'm going to use. If I'm looking for a, a catheter that will allow me to distend the tubes and get fluid out with sonosopagography, I will use a balloon catheter. But if I'm looking at a pinpoint cervix, found oftentimes with noliparous patients, some menopausal patients, I will then select a smaller catheter, which I will demonstrate to you. If it's patchless, I will look at one, either the Goldstein or a balloon catheter. I prep the cervix, typically using betadine or a 4% ebuclin solution if patients are allergic to iodine. I then connect a 10 cc syringe. I purge air out of the catheter. I actually find it helpful to bend the catheters a little bit. Now, there are some catheters, and I'll show you one that has a metal stylet that allows me to bend it very effectively, but others, I merely put a bend on it for about four to five seconds, and what it allows me to do is to insert the catheter with avoidance of a tenaculum, and more often than not, avoidance of os finders, et cetera. I insert the catheter, I remove the speculum, then I reinsert my ultrasound. Now, what catheters do I use? I'm going to show you a number here that are available. For the pinpoint cervical loss, I use a Shepherd catheter. This is an, actually an insemination catheter. It's 5.4 French. If you recall, the conversion from millimeters to French is 3 to 1, so this is actually about a 2 millimeter catheter, a little smaller. It does have a metal stylet. You can see it right here. Now, that stylet has an opening, but it's only about 1 millimeter. But this is easily inserted into a menopausal type of cervix or a pinpoint looking cervix. It's very helpful. If I anticipate doing a biopsy, I'd like to use the Goldstein sonobiopsy catheter. You'll note it's a little thicker than his traditional catheter. It does have a larger side port for the biopsy, and it's a little more rigid. You'll see that there are centimeter marks on this, which allow me to set it at the appropriate depth based on that measurement I made at the beginning of my ultrasound. Now, the Tampa catheter is a uh, designed catheter for SIS, very nice, relatively flimsy, however, but it works quite well. If I have a patchless cervix or I'm looking at doing tubal assessment, I will use a balloon catheter, and my personal preference is to use one that's more elliptical in shape, such as this one or this one, and the reason for that is if for some reason I can't insert the catheter into the cavity directly, this allows me to distend the balloon in the cervix, and more often than not, it will not pop out. Sometimes with the round balloons, it'll tend to pop out. So these are kind of my raft of, I tend to have three catheters available at all times. So let's show basically doing an SIS, not in real time, but in stepwise slide fashion. This is using the Goldstein catheter. Here, this is the traditional one that's a little flimsier. You can see the cone there. I stabilize it with a ring force. If I don't clamp down on the ring force, if I just use it to stabilize. After having prepped the cervix, I then insert the catheter. Now, you'll notice I'm not using an open-sided speculum. I'm going to discuss that a little bit further. But once I've inserted it, I stabilize the catheter. I then open up the speculum a little bit. I press down to open up the blades on the inside. And the reason for that is that as I pull back, it will avoid pinching the cervix plus it'll avoid inadvertently pulling the catheter out. I then bring it back. Now by using a 10 cc syringe, I can put it through a closed sided speculum. I don't require an open sided speculum. Now I deal with patients that range in size from 100 pounds to 700 pounds. And you can imagine that trying to find a speculum that's suitable for each one of those persons requires an array of different types of speculums. It's difficult for me to have closed ones that meet those same requirements and open ones that similarly do it. So I found I can use a closed speculum using a 10 cc syringe. In most cases, I use less than 10 cc's to do an SIS, but there are those times when I have to have another syringe and use somewhere between 20 to 30, but that's the exception rather than the rule. Now, once I've done this, I reinsert the ultrasound and I observe the fluid going in under real time. Uh, I know some people who actually inject the fluid, then put the ultrasound in. I don't prefer to do that. I prefer to do it under real-time uh, in injection. I then will capture a sagittal and transverse view. 
if I have 3D available, which I do, I capture a view and when I'm doing the sagittal capture. I will get a sagittal trans, uh, sweep of the uterus. And then I measure the uterus, the endometrium in a sagittal view. So here we are. We have a catheter that's inserted. It's right down here. We're now going to push fluid in. This is two cc's of fluid. I'm done. This is an absolutely normal endometrial evaluation. There are no filling defects. The endometrium is uniform and symmetric. Let's look at this one. This shows a uniform and symmetric endometrium that measures equally on both sides. When I put fluid in, I'm looking for two things. One are focal lesions, submucous myomas, polyps, focal areas of thickening. And two is symmetry. I want to make sure that the anterior and the posterior walls are symmetric. If they are not, then we have to realize that a global biopsy will not give us an answer of where the abnormality could potentially be. Now here we look transversely. Again, this confirms that I'm not seeing any filling defects. I'm very comfortable that this is normal. My caution here is don't measure the endometrium in a transverse view, measure it in the sagittal view, because you can get a falsely thickened endometrium sometimes in a transverse view, particularly with a well-flexed uterus. Now I mentioned that there's limitations. Here we're using this Shepherd catheter. It's an insemination catheter. The fluid is going out almost as quickly as it's going in. My options to manage this are the following. One is do a 3D sweep. And I will demonstrate later how a 3D sweep can actually help us. Two is switch catheters. Sometimes I just have to switch catheters. It just didn't work. So just keep it in mind that this is a catheter that I might use a lot, but sometimes I have to resort to another catheter. Now, I briefly showed these kits. Kits are nice. They have everything in them. You see there's a disposable speculum. There are swabs. There may be the catheter, etc. I have three objections to these. Number one is I've already mentioned that this is a one-size speculum. One size does not fit all in my hands. Two is, is it only includes betadine. And what if they're allergic to iodine? I have to substitute something else. They do, this one does have a catheter, but if it's not the catheter I prefer to use, then I have to get a whole other catheter. Beyond that, these are relatively expensive compared to what I use, which is this. What I have is a sterile saline, I have a syringe that was open sterile, and I have a sterile catheter. The rest of this is a clean procedure. The OS finders I have now up sterile as a separate package. I do not open them all the time. This is my up regardless of whether I'm using a catheter for SIS, sonobiopsy, or sonosalpingography. So here we're showing it with a Shepherd catheter. Here we are with the balloon catheter. It's exactly the same setup. So it's very easy, very inexpensive. Now, let's go through some more cases. Here's a patient that we're scanning, and the endometrium looks thick. If I were to measure this, I would probably measure from here to here, but visually that looks thick. So we're going to put some fluid in, and what do we see? Well, we see a large endometrial polyp. We see the surrounding endometrium is really quite thin. And we see at the fundus another area where it could be a polyp or could it just be some blood that's collected up there. Certainly this patient is going to be appropriate now for operative hysteroscopy with planned polypectomy. But when we go to surgery, what we're going to find is, is that we are planning for this with the appropriate equipment, appropriate pump systems, and appropriate preparation uh, prior to surgery. Here's a patient where in the transverse view we can see multiple polyps. We now know when we go in and we see this that you're going to see that this virtually replicates exactly the image we see at hysteroscopy. So this helps us prepare for surgery and what we're going to find. So let's kind of go through the findings again and make sure we understand it. Endometrial polyps, they tend to be hyperechoic when compared to the myometrium and isoechoic to the endometrium. Sometimes it will have a small scattered cystic space. So when I start to see cystic spaces in the endometrium, I become highly suspicious of an endometrial polyp. Oftentimes you will find that there's a central vessel that feeds them. Here we've done an SIS and it shows the vessel feeding an endometrial polyp. Well, if we do this without SIS, if you put Doppler on, and I tend to use power Doppler with low uh, pulse repetition frequency or high sensitivity, if I detect flow in the endometrium, I think of an endometrial polyp, and when we put fluid in, here we've demonstrated the endometrial polyp. Now, let me pose another case to 
open up another can of worms for us. A patient came in with abnormal bleeding, you did an endometrial biopsy, and it showed disordered proliferative endometrium and a portion of an endometrial polyp. The question is, and I can't see hands, but how many of you would take the patient to the OR on the basis of this biopsy alone? In other words, a blind endometrial biopsy that shows a polyp, how often are we really going to find a polyp there? Now, this data I'm going to present to you is not published yet. It's in final preparation for submission, but I thought it would be helpful for understanding. We looked at this in Louisville and reviewed a number of charts with patients who were found to have polyps, and we confirmed these by surgical specimens, etc. So we looked at the biopsy that said polyp, and then we looked at the surgical confirmation. We found that the prevalence of polyps based on surgical confirmation was 30%, similar to that number that Dr. Brown and I found in our SIS study, but slightly higher than what is published in this age group. But what we found was this. The prevalence was 30%. The positive predictive value, in other words, those that truly had a polyp, 51%. The false positives are those who did not have a polyp, 49%. We're flipping a coin. It's 50-50. Well, we now have felt that based on this, that we typically do not take patients to the OR based on the biopsy only, because half of the time we're going to look in and there will not be a polyp there. We subjected the patient to surgery, the cost of surgery, the loss of time from work with a negative finding. So we do tend to look at evaluating the patients. Now, here's a patient with a thickened endometrium. We put Doppler on and we see that there appears to be flow in the cavity. I now have a high index of suspicion for a polyp. We put fluid in. Now we know she has an endometrial polyp. This is someone on this biopsy alone and this finding on SIS. We take her to surgery now for definitive surgery with a hysteroscopic polypectomy. Now, what about 3D? And for those who don't use 3D, this is a great place to start to use it. 3D offers us the ability to acquire a volume at which we can reconstruct images after the image is complete, after the exam is complete. I typically do one to two sweeps to garnish information. Now, let's show this case, and I think you'll see how helpful it can be. This 57-year-old presents with postmenopausal bleeding. She's had a prior tubal ligation. She has no hormone therapy, and just her prior surgery is noted. We look with the ultrasound unenhanced, and I think we would all agree this endometrium looks thick. It looks thick to me. Now, I've measured from the fundus to the external loss. This is a ballpark. It's not a sweep in the curve, a curve but it's about 7.5 centimeters. This is because I'm in preparation. I probably will want to do a biopsy on this endometrium. Now, we look and actually measure the endometrium at 23.6 millimeters. This is clearly thick for a postmenopausal patient. Now what we're going to do is to look in real time. And as we look, what you see is it appears to me that there is a lesion within the endometrium. Maybe it's even a submucous myoma from looking at it. But it's, it certainly appears to be a lesion within the cavity. Now, this is convincing. When we put Doppler on, this is fairly convincing for a central vessel that's feeding what appears to be now an endometrial polyp. Well, now we're going to put some fluid in to confirm this. And as we put fluid in, you're going to note that the distension of the cavity is very limited. Well, I've taken a 3D sweep of this. And what you'll see is, what information can we learn from this 3D sweep? Well, we have now reconstructed this image. We have done some manipulation. This is actually a transverse view, a longitudinal view that's actually flipped because of our movement. And this is the coronal view of the uterus. And when we look at that coronal view, what we see is, there is a mass arising from the left uterine wall. A little bit of fluid is here, and we can define that this mass is present. Now, when we go back to the orthogonal planes, we can actually measure this mass because we can see the fluid that is surrounding it adequate enough to measure it. And this measures about 3 by 2 and a half centimeters. So despite the fact that I couldn't get a great image in order to distend the cavity to demonstrate this beautifully, the 3D allowed me to demonstrate this quite adequately to say, now when I go to surgery, I know exactly what I'm going to run into. Now, polyps, we can see what about fibroids? Well, this particular patient has both a polyp and a fibroid. This is an endometrial polyp and a submucous myoma. 
it appears to be located here posteriorly, and when you do the coronal view, it is now in the left corneal region. So this is very helpful in looking at that. Here we have a patient that has a submucous myoma. They typically are isoechoic or hypoechoic to the myometrium. They tend to have posterior acoustic shadowing such that there is this Venetian blind effect that we see typically with fibroids. And she happens to have a balloon catheter in with fluid in it. That's going to be a little hint I'm going to give you later. So with submucous myomas, we can actually now talk about what type of myoma we're dealing with. And this is important when one does, determines the surgical removal of these fibroids. A type 0 almost looks like a polyp, very easy to be removed hysteroscopically. A type 1 penetrates more than 50% into the cavity, less than 50% into the myometrium, a little harder to remove, but certainly acceptable. A type 2 penetrates more than 50% into the myometrium. These are harder to remove. They may actually have a higher failure rate and may require a repeat surgical procedure. So let's look at some of these. This is an SIS. We're looking at this, and I called it. Could it be a submucous myoma or a polyp? It could be. It looks like it's a type 0. It almost looks surrounded, but when we look at it, this virtually looks like a polyp, but when removed, it has bundles of smooth muscle, thus it's a submucous myoma rather than glandular tissue associated with the polyp. This is the fiber we looked at before. This looks like it's attached down here, but it almost could be surrounded. So it's either a type 0 or a type 1. When we look in hysteroscopically, we see fluid virtually surrounding it its entirety, but it does appear to be attached a small amount, particularly down here posteriorly. So technically, this would be a type 1 because it penetrates into the myometrium a little bit. It's not hanging free form in the cavity. Now, 3D with a coronal view, look how this helps us. Here we see a myoma in the lower uterine segment, which looks like it's penetrating the myometrium, but you can see that the endometrium surrounds it entirely. So this is technically a type 0 myoma. This, however, we can see the endometrium surrounding this, but it penetrates more than 50% into the myometrium. Does this, or excuse me, less than 50% into the myometrium, more than 50% into the endometrium, it is a type 1. Now this is a difficult one because this overlies the left corneal region, the left tubal ostia. If this were an infertility patient, you would have to counsel the patient that removal of this myoma could render her left tube non-functional. So this is very critical. Now in Brazil, they've actually come up with a classification system to categorize myomas on their ease of removal. And so when we look at this, here's an SIS. We have a type 1 myoma, submucous myoma. But they've gone further. They said, let's look at it more carefully. Yes, it's a type 1 myoma. It measures about 3 centimeters in size, so we'll give it a score of 1. It's in the middle of the cavity. We'll add 2. So now we're up to 2. At the base of it, probably about 2 thirds of the base is involved. Now we're about 3 and it penetrates less than 50%, it's a 4. This is ranked as a low-complexity hysteroscopic myomectomy. So this one should be able to be done fairly easily. If we look at this patient, this 61-year-old who presents with postmenopausal bleeding, you note she has several major medical conditions, uh, not only the hypertension or MRI and her CVA, but she also has coronary artery disease and is scheduled for a bypass. And oh, by the way, she's got a BMI of 48. So this is a patient that if my preference is, do I need to operate on her? And if so, can I wait for her bypass to be done? So we do an SIS. And what we see is, this is a sagittal view. We can see the fluid coming up over a mass inside the cavity. In the transverse view, now it looks like the fluid surrounds it almost in its entirety, but it looks like it's connected here. What we see now is, is if we look in the coronal view, look how nicely we demonstrate a submucous myoma arising from the fundus. It penetrates somewhat into the myometrium. The surrounding endometrium is paper thin. This measures about 3 centimeters in size. We did a biopsy. The biopsy showed atrophic endometrium. Her bleeding is coming from this submucous myoma. So we can now elect to allow the patient to get her coronary bypass done Assuming she recovers from that fully, now we can move to treatment of her abnormal bleeding in this situation. So if we were to score this, this measures 3 centimeters, 1. It's in the upper part of the uterus now, that's 3. The extension of the base up 
maybe a little more than two thirds. That's four or five penetration less than 50%, six. High complexity hysteroscopic myomectomy, consider GnRH use or a two-step hysteroscopic myomectomy. So this is helping them predict how easily they can remove these myomas. Now, in our acronym we had adenomyosis, how does SIS help us? Well, adenomyosis is really a clinical diagnosis in large part due to dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia. It's present in a lot of patients and certainly a lot of hysterectomy specimens. But if you look at ultrasound diagnosis, this is Bromley, Brian Bromley's study from 2000. And I use this a lot because if you get two out of four of these, you have about an 85 predictive value in finding adenomyosis. The ones I find most useful are the enlarged globular uterus and the heterogeneous myometrial equitexture or inhomogeneous equitexture. Note small cystic spaces in the myometrium and an indistinct endometrial myometrial interface. Her study said stripe, so that's why I use the term stripe, but we prefer endometrial myometrial interface. And this is what it looks like. The heterogeneous myometrium or inhomogeneous myometrium. A globularly enlarged uterus. If you were to measure this uterus and it measures 12 centimeters and you don't see any definite fibroids, that would raise my index of suspicion for adenomyosis. Here we see small cystic spaces, and over here it's hard to define where is the endometrium, where does the myometrium come in. As the endometrium invades the myometrium, we lose that distinct border. So let's look at this case. This is a case with adenomyosis. This has one of the minor criteria, and that is asymmetry of the myometrium. Here we see heterogeneous myometrium. The anterior wall is significantly thicker than the posterior wall. The endometrium measures five millimeters. Now, we're going to do an SIS. This is a sagittal view. And I want you to notice this little indentation going up into the myometrium right here. There we go. Now, let's look at a transverse view of this. As we look transversely, look what happens. By inserting the fluid, we are naturally forcing fluid now into this invagination and filling a small cystic space, which is an island of glands in the myometrium. So when we look at this, it's understandable that if you do an endometrial ablation in a patient with this adenomyosis, the chance of treating that glandular area that's in the myometrium is quite limited. So these patients are going to be subject to a greater failure rate. And here we see it again in a transverse view. What we see is this very nicely demonstrated island. And note that we're trying to measure this, thinking it's almost an intramural myoma but you don't have all the characteristics. Look over here. This does not look like that typical myoma. It's only after we added fluid in that we thought we could see this. This is actually an adenomyoma. One does not want to pursue removing this in an individual state. And a little hint, when I'm doing SIS, particularly with the balloon catheter, if I cannot distend the cavity, if I cannot distend the cavity, I worry about cancer. This is not uniform. But if I have someone I can't distine the cavity, it starts to raise my index of suspicion for cancer. So my pearls, fill the balloon with fluid, infuse the saline slowly, particularly if they've had a prior tubal, and then reduce the fluid in the balloon, and as you withdraw the catheter, inject a little saline to help evaluate the lower uterine segment and the cervix. The Goldstein catheter, stabilize the acorn before you remove it. Don't allow the speculum to close as you withdraw it and to remove your probe before removing the catheter itself. Do not forget your abdominal probe, particularly in patients with a midplane uterus or an enlarged fibroid uterus. You may find that when you do SIS, the cavity is much higher than you anticipate, and that you can see very easily with an abdominal probe. How good is this? It's almost equivalent to hysteroscopy. So I can't say it's perfect. Neither of them are, but very close. Plus, SIS allows you to evaluate the adnexa in the bladder at the same time. It's notably better than just ultrasound alone, but it does not allow us to diagnose hyperplasia or cancer, which is then why we need to do sonobiopsy. And what sonobiopsy is, is really using the catheter we use for SIS to obtain our biopsy. It's a one-step procedure. Now, there's two catheters made for this specifically. The Bernard Lecaroux is a modification of the Pipel, which uses a lure lock connector. The Goldstein sonobiopsy catheter, we've already described, it's a little thicker than the normal catheter, has a little wider side port. The setup is exactly the same as I used before. 
Now, here we're measuring from the fundal endometrium down to the external loss of the cervix. It's 6.3 centimeters. I would set my little pyramid, my little cone, at 6 centimeters. After I've done my SIS, I evacuate fluid. I discard that fluid. I hook the syringe back up. I pull back on the plunger to create suction. And then I use that catheter just as I would a pipel. I move in and out and rotate 360 degrees to get my sample. So let's look at this. Here's another patient. We could barely distend the cavity, but you'll see in the coronal view, there are no intracavitary lesions. The endometrium is uniform and symmetric. We're now going to do a biopsy. And what you'll see here under direct vision, we can actually do this biopsy. You'll see the catheter go in and out. We are rotating at 360 degrees. So we can get a very good specimen comparable to a pipel-like biopsy instrument. Here we have another one. We infuse the saline. We're now going to use the Shepherd catheter in this case. And what you'll see is this one's very easy to see because of the insert, the metal insert. We're going back and forth and rotating 360 degrees. Now let me show you another one. This patient has a retroverted uterus, multiple cystic areas in where the endometrium ought to be, and the endometrium is thick at 19 millimeters. We put fluid in, and it confirms the presence of a polyp measuring 3.3 by 1.9 centimeters. But before I take this patient to surgery, I want to make sure that she does not have endometrial hyperplasia with atypia, et cetera. So I will do a biopsy. And this shows us doing the biopsy. This is a retroverted uterus, so the catheter goes into the anterior wall. We are rotating this 360 degrees, and you'll note that it's not moving to the other wall. Now, that's understandable. You have a polyp in the way. But if you do this under direct vision, and what you'll learn to understand is that despite rotating these in a 360-degree fashion, you do not sample the other endometrial area. My per pearls for success here measure the lengths from the external cervical loss to the top of the uterine fundus. Evacuate as much fluid as possible. If you use saline, it does not impact your histologic specimen. You rotate the syringe 360 degrees, move it in and out when you're applying negative pressure. And then after you've gotten the tissue, place it into the formalin, and then flush your catheter with the formalin to get all tissue out. Now, how well does this work? This interesting study out of New York last year looked at over 600 patients. You'll see the indication. Most were postmenopausal bleeding. Here's that 15% with a thickened endometrium. They had two methods, a simultaneous and a sequential method. The simultaneous meant that they did an endometrial aspiration in all cases. Sequential meant they only did an aspiration if there was an abnormality seen. Well, what they found was this. They used an insemination catheter, and they were able to do it in 94% of patients. And if they said, we're trying to find cancer or hyperplasia, that's what we're going to consider abnormal. The simultaneous method is more sensitive but less specific. It makes sense. You're going to biopsy everybody, so you're going to have a lot more faults or a lot more negatives that you're going to see. The sequential was more specific but less sensitive. But let's change this now and say, in a menopausal patient, if you get proliferative endometrium, is that normal? And that's a little worrisome. And what they said is using that, the sensitivity was simultaneous and sequential were both 100%. The specificity was sequential was much greater. Now, here's a take-home message I learned from this study. Is if they considered proliferative endometrium normal, their screen positive rate was 4.5% of patients that went to surgery. What they found was, ultimately, they missed 13% of patients who had hyperplasia and cancer. If, however, you consider proliferative endometrium abnormal in a postmenopausal patient, 13% of patients were screened positive and they missed no hyperplasias or cancer. So if you do a blind biopsy in a postmenopausal patient and it comes back proliferative endometrium, think that's not normal. Those patients, I will oftentimes move them towards hysteroscopy very early on because that should not be normal. And let's finish up talking about sonosopengography for the last several minutes. This basically allows us to assess tubal patency. And what we see is there are several different methods, HSG, laparoscopy, or this hycosci, hysterocontrast sonography. We wrote a paper on this and found that actually it's quite effective. We compared it to the different methods. And what we identify are these proximal scintillations in the tube, which demonstrate flow of the contrast through the tube. Now, the indications for this are infertility, which allows us to evaluate the endometrial contour with SIS and then assess tubal patency at the same time when we insert a balloon catheter at the same, at the same time. Now, contraindications include a pelvic infection or hydrosalpinx, which is a relative contraindication. 
What do we use? In the U.S., air and saline is what is used. That's what I use. Uh, there is an aqueous galactose solution available. There are even contrast agents, but I stick with air and saline. I perform the SIS initially purposely using a balloon catheter. Then I switch my 10 cc syringe to a 30 cc syringe that I place 15 cc's of saline and 15 cc's of air. And then I assess the tubal patency in transverse orientation. So here's my coronal view of the uterus with SIS, perfectly normal. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my catheters. Here is how it's assembled. Very similar setup with one exception. Here's my 30 cc syringe, 15 cc's of saline, the rest in air. Now, the way I do this is I take that syringe that I have here, I point it towards the ceiling, and then I point it towards the floor, and I alternate back and forth. What that does is it admixes air and saline and creates the contrast. There is a commercial device made that does this very nicely, air in one syringe, saline in the other. I don't use this on a regular basis, and the reason is cost. We cannot bill individually for the instrumentation that we use during a procedure, so the cost of this device comes off our margin. So I just tend not to use it. It works very well. I just don't use it on a regular basis. You can recreate it actually fairly simply with a three-way stopcock, two syringes, fill one with saline, the other with air, keep the stopcock open to both sides, and you could have your an assistant inject air, then saline, air, then saline, air, then saline. I will just say I use the single method, and it works quite well. So let's look at what this looks like. Here's an actual study being done. Fortuitously, we can see both tubes are open at both times. This is somewhat rare, actually, to be able to see it this nicely. But here we can see both of them, proximal scintillations going down, so we can know both tubes are open. What we're really evaluating are three different zones, the intratubal portion, the ampullary portion, and the distal spill from the fimbria. So as we look at this, we're going to first look at the intramural portion. We look at the ampullary portion and then the fimbria. And I'll keep it on so we can see that fimbria with the scintillations down by the fimbria. So what we see is you can see this move and we can see the scintillations. This is relatively gross. This tells me the tube is open. It does not tell me if this tube has sapongitis is myconodosa, but it does tell me it's open. Here we have occluded tubes. Here's the right fallopian tube we're trying to see. It does not open up. Here we're looking at the left one, and you'll see that the scintillation just circulates within the endometrial cavity. It does not fill the tube. So when we look at this, what we see is, let's compare it to an HSG. Pain-wise, it's less than an HSG, and the patients described it as being less than a period. How effective is it compared to HSG, laparoscopy? All the time what you're going to see is somewhere in the 83 90% range, 80 to 90% range concordance. Caterina axis custis looked at it individually compared to HSG, laparoscopy, et cetera, and the concordance of all of them, 86 to 89%. So it's equivalent to HSG in evaluating this. This table in our particular uh, article shows a comparison. What I would say is we cannot diagnose sapongitis sismiconodosa, but we do have the ability to evaluate the external contour of the uterus, the ovaries, and the fallopian tubes in one study. So it's equivalent to HSG. It evaluates the external contour and evals, eval, gives us the ability to evaluate the neighboring structures. So if you look at it, it really is a quite effective method in evaluating patients in the office. How do you bill for all this stuff? Well, here are the two codes you use for sonohysterography: hysterography, 76831 and 58340. Notice that 76831 includes all the elements of a vaginal ultrasound so you don't charge separately, and it includes Doppler. So if you find an adnexal mass, you Doppler. At SIS, you do not add in a Doppler code. Sonosapongography is exactly the same code. Commercial vendors have advocated using multiple codes in addition to this. ASRM, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, recommends coding for a sonosopongography or HICOSI with the two codes, just as you would an SIS. If you do a sonobiopsy, what you need to do then is your two codes plus add the endometrial biopsy code separately. So what are our take-home messages? Number one is sonohysterography better delineates the endometrial cavity than just ultrasound. 
it actually, I think, will replace ultrasound alone as a first-line evaluation for abnormal uterine bleeding. In our hands, we use SIS quite often. Sonobiopsy allows a one-step procedure for complete diagnosis of abnormal bleeding, and sonosalpingography is essentially equivalent to HSG, but gives us the opportunity to evaluate not only tubal patency, but external uterine contour and the adnexa. I want to thank you for your attention, and I see there are a few questions here that I hopefully will be able to bring up. Um, let's see, how do you... Having troubles reading this a little bit. Look for okay. I may have to ask you to read them to me, Kathy, because I can't see them on my screen. Sure. Um, one question we have is uh, well, we got greetings from Mazatlan, Mexico, which is lovely, and then a question. Thank you very much. Yes, and then a question. Okay. Do you check consistency of lesion with water-filled balloon to differentiate polyp and fibroids? That's an interesting question, and the answer is I do not do it with that. Actually, if I do that, I do that more with a Shepherd catheter um, or the Goldstein catheter because you can touch it directly and see if there's a consistency that's different. The problem with the water-filled balloons is that they don't move in and out as easy. They will move in and out, but you don't get the tactile sensation. The catheter is much more flexible, and you kind of require a little more rigid one. So you can do that. I do most of my differentiation based on is there Doppler flow in a central vessel, which would imply a polyp. If the flow is lateral, it's a myoma. And two is the echo density, does it appear to be that of a myo myometrium or of the endometrium? Thank you for that question. Okay, and here's another one. In case of hydrosalpinx, we can push fluid to the tube. Does it mean tube? tubes are open or functional? So if I'm understanding this correctly, in the case of a hydrosalpinx and you're able to push fluid and it spills at the other end, it means the tube is patent, but is it going to be functionally active? And I would suggest to you that it's not. My routine is that when I do my screening ultrasound, if I find a hydrosalpinx, I do not proceed with sonosalpingography immediately. I give that patient short-term prophylactic antibiotics before and after the procedure, very much as I would after an HSG. But I think in today's world, what we see in fertility is if you see a hydrosalpinx, more often than not, particularly if they're progressing towards IVF, we'll remove that tube because the hydrosalpinx tends to reduce the pregnancy rates following assisted reproduction. Okay, and another question. Do you ever need to use an Alice or a tenaculum during the procedure? I will make a short answer and say yes. I rarely use it, but yes, I do. And I, I'm embarrassed because yesterday, two times, I had to use an Alice clamp. So yes, I do have to use an Alice clamp or a tenaculum, but I try not to do it initially. There are those patients where there is a little more uh, movement of the cervix, if you will. You try to insert the catheter, it moves away from you. The thing I found very effective, and I do this with my endometrial biopsies, as well if I am using a pipel is I actually bend the catheter and I the advantage of the ultrasound ahead of time is you get to know if this is an antiflexed or retroflexed uterus and you can oftentimes guide it in. What I do is I put the catheter in until I meet a little resistance and if I don't pass the resistance I just rotate the catheter a very small amount and sometimes that will redirect it the way you need to. If that doesn't work, I will then get an os finder to try to dilate that a little more. If that doesn't work, then I use a tenaculum or Alice clamp, stabilize the cervix, and insert. Thank you for that question. Okay, and how do you perform SIS when you know that the patient is being sent for congenital uterine anomalies, such as uterine septum versus bicornuate uterus? This is a great question. First thing I do is I scan the patient unenhanced and use 3D liberally. This is a place 3D is incredibly valuable to this. It is as effective as MRI in defining the type of anomaly you have. The next thing is, is that if you have a septum, you can put in a catheter in and you will be able to demonstrate both corneal regions as well as both tubes without any difficulty. If I have a complete division all the way down, then I have been known to put a catheter in each cervical loss to demonstrate what each cavity looks like or if I want to demonstrate tubal patency. So you will demonstrate and identify the anomaly based on your screening ultrasound in 3D, and then your SIS will depend on if the lower uterine segment and cervix are divided or if they're unified. 
Okay, and do you agree that an ultrasound characteristic of adenomyosis is increased anterior blood flow with color Doppler? When my other side of me, the attorney comes out and says, my gosh, I just got to ask a loaded question. Um, one of the things in a minor category you see is that you do can do see increased blood flow sometimes with adenomyosis. And as, as opposed to seeing the arcuate vessels that are surrounding the endometrium, what they do is they pierce through usually at right angles. So it can be associated with that. One comment I might make is, is I have many people ask, well, why don't you get an MRI? MRI can be more effective, if you will, but it's much more costly, it's much more difficult, and the reality is we're not going to manage the patient based on an MRI or an ultrasound. We're going to say our index of suspicion is adenomyosis. The way we manage the patient is based on their clinical status and response to therapy. Okay, thank you. And would you recommend SIS over plain ultrasound for all patients with AUB? I would recommend a screening ultrasound for all patients and then an SIS if indicated. And how do I go with if indicated? If they have a thin endometrium, particularly postmenopausal, I may elect not to do it initially, uh, less than four millimeters. If they persist on bleeding, then the answer is yes, I resort to that because those patients can have an increased risk of malignancy, about 10%, and they can have the presence of a polyp or myoma even with a thin endometrium. In the reproductive age group, and those patients, I think it's a little more difficult to see. We saw Dan Brykoff's study that said 8%, even less than 5 millimeters, have polyps or fibroids. So I liberally go to uh, SIS in the initial evaluation. If there's any evidence that the endometrium is thickened or it's indistinct or there's an in endometrial myometrial interface is difficult to identify, I will then go to SIS for more definition. Okay, great. And that looks like the last of our questions. So I want to thank you very much, Dr. Schwader, and thanks to everybody who participated in tonight's webinar. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed this evening's presentation, and will join us again for future webinars. Good night, everyone. Have a great evening. All righty. Thank you.